If you're not already familiar, this is my universal ventilation layout. And I've run this by everybody who does Matt Reisinger's ventilation designs, by other mechanical engineers elsewhere in the country, and none of us can really find anything wrong with it. And the thing that you'll kind of notice about this is that we got dehumidifier with the optional outdoor air intake, and we've also got ERV on this with obviously outdoor air coming into it. And that's kind of an either or decision often. Some people are deciding in places like Florida and in New Orleans, very humid places, to instead of opting for an ERV, to use fresh air coming in through a dehumidifier so that you can bam, right away dehumidify that air that's coming in because it's so swampy. And so I'd like to kind of demonstrate because I get this question a fair amount where, oh, should we use a dehu? that ventilates, or should we use an ERV? And what is the kind of relationship between those two? So I have a quick example that I ran the other day for our Patreon group, and if you wanna join that, you can do that for as little as $5 a month. We hang out twice a month uh, and talk about things like this, really just nerd out. So what I'd like to show you first, really quickly, is we're gonna use this site to kind of assess how big the dehumidifier needs to be later. And I wanted to give you another quick example of an introduction to this. So I had a question uh, that is pertinent to this dehumidification ERV conversation with somebody who was thinking those things, but they were also thinking, where should I live? And so the question was, should I live in uh, Arlington, Virginia, which is right next to Ronald Reagan Airport in DC, or should I live back in Austin? I'm sensitive to mold. So what should I do? Which place is safer for me? And we can use this website to do that analysis. So let's first look at uh, Arlington, Virginia. What we wanna know, we come down here, you can see the heating uh, dry bulb temperature, 99% coldest it gets here in uh, Arlington, Virginia, 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Hottest it gets here, design-wise, 99% rule, 92 degrees. I know it gets colder and hotter there. You don't have to comment that. Uh, this is based on historical data. This is the 99% hottest and coldest that it gets. What we then want to do is take this number and look at this number right away. Diagonal right down from it. 92 degrees hottest, 82 degrees wettest. That is where there is the most moisture in the air. We thought for about 100 years, apparently, that the hottest temperature was also when there was the most humidity in the air because relative humidity is relative to the temperature and that warmer the air is the more moisture it can hold so therefore it kind of follows that yeah hotter would be wetter but what they found when they actually started measuring it ashray back in the 1990s is that like that's not what happens at all so there's a 10 degree difference between the hottest and the wettest temperature in uh, arlington virginia and at that wettest temperature we have 129 grains of moisture per pound that's called absolute humidity. Relative humidity is mushy because it's relative to the temperature, so we can't really use that. We wanna know actually how much water there is in the air. By the way, a really fun experiment that I've been running a lot this week is you take this psychrometric wheel calculator that I've got on my website. I'm linking a video uh, link on screen right now for you to download it for free. If you take 75 degree air and you lock it in at 50% relative humidity, which is what we want in wintertime, if you then let that air go down into the basement, and the basement happens to be 65 degrees, that air is now at 72% relative humidity. That's pretty scary sounding in the summertime when you've got 70% relative humidity in your basement. So it's not that there's more wetness down there, it's that the wetness has a different relationship to the temperature of the air. Okay, so now let's go look at Austin. We've got this 10 degree delta between hottest and wettest, and we've got 129, just shy of 130. When we go to Austin, we can see exactly the same data. 99% cold as it gets is about 30. That's about the same. The hottest here is 98 and a half. And the wettest is 80 and a half. So that's an 18 degree delta between the hottest and the wettest. That's almost double. And what that means is that the air conditioning system here is designed to really be able to flex its muscles at 98 degrees. At 81 degrees, it's really not having to work much at all. It's muscular enough that it can just push the house a little bit and it cools right down, which means that it's not gonna be running very long, which means we cannot depend on the air conditioner as much to dehumidify the house in Austin as we can in Washington, D.C. It would be best if they were actually at the same temperature, so then your air conditioner would be working its hardest while it's hot and doing the most good for you dehumidification-wise. The amount of humidity we have in the air at the bottom of this 18 degree difference in 
temperature at the wettest is 137, another whole 10 grains of moisture per pound uh, wet. So the quick knee-jerk analysis on this is that Austin is more dangerous for mold in homes than Arlington, Virginia is. Okay, now let's get into this other conversation. We have a home that's in Houston, not very far from Austin. Houston, very different though, because we've got not just the hot, we've got the 94 down to 82. It's not quite as much of a delta, but at 82 degrees, we've got 145 grains of moisture per pound. That is a lot. That's almost as much as you'll ever find in the United States of America. We top out at about 150 grains of moisture per pound. You want it to be 65. 65 grains of moisture per pound at the wettest end, that's 75 degrees, 50% relative humidity. And at the low end in the winter time, you want it to be 35 grains of moisture per pound. That's 70 degrees, 30% relative humidity. So that's your range, 35 to 65. By the way, I made that up. That's not in any book that you'll find. <laughs> but it is basically 30% to 50%. We, we tend to like those numbers. So now, if we talk about a specific example within Houston, we have a 2,200 square foot single story ranch with a vented crawl space, vented attic over the top of it. So it's only eight feet high with four occupants, which three bedrooms, bedrooms plus one is the number of occupants you put in, into this uh, facel right here. And the leakage that this builder is planning is two ACH 50, which you take the volume, you divide by 60. That gives you your one ACH 50, two ACH 50 would be 586 CFM 50 on the blower door. What this now says is that our outdoor air requirement for this home is gonna be 96 CFM. 13 of this is coming from outside air, just leaking in through gaps and cracks. We then have to hook up a machine, either a ventilating dehumidifier or an ERV, or just a shunt from the outside air to the return side of our forced air system to bring air in from outside, which is in Houston, don't do that. Super wet, it's gonna condense all over the inside of your return, it's gonna be nasty. Uh, one of those three ways is what you're going to have to do at this point. And so what are we going to do? And by the way, when I say have to, I mean both for code and also just to keep your house healthy. So now if we took a look at this equation, which is my dehumidifier sizing calculation, this one right here, you take the Delta grains per pound times the CFM of air that's going to be coming into the home times our coefficient of 0 0.0148, which has a bunch of different things in it. And you can see all of that in the dehumidifier sizing video that I'm looking on screen right now. It will tell you what, how many pints per day of dehumidification are needed in the home. Incidentally, for those of you who uh, do manual J reports, when you find out what the latent BTU per hour is, you can divide that number by 42.1 and it also tells you the pints per day. You don't wanna trust the manual J though, because Manual J is targeting the hottest temperature, not the max humidity. So this number is not how many pints per day you need to install if you're just using a Manual J latent that it spits out. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion since we're talking about hottest versus wettest. So when we actually do this calculation, we got 80 grains per pound difference between 145 and 65. That's the ideal and where we're starting at outside. We have 84 CFM coming inside through either the ERV or the dehumidifier or whatever it is that you're using to bring that mechanical, that air inside, times our coefficient and it gives us 99 pints per day dehumidification needed for this house. Now we can look at this kind of a, a sheet which I keep handy all the time. Uh, I'm gonna use Santa Fe as an example just because they, they make good stuff and it's got a six year warranty on it. And the ventilating process is also part of this line. Let's go with the Ultra 98. We have 99 needed. Let's just buy the 98. We'll be one pint per day away. What it says right here is that, yeah, it'll do 98 pints per day at this AHAM point of 80 degrees, 60% relative humidity. You would never want that to be what's going on in your house. So they give you this secondary number, which is more realistic. It can do 72 pints per day. In fact, the 120 pint per day dehumidifier can do 79 pints per day. What we really need is over here. This is a 155 pint per day dehumidifier. So we can see here that uh, when you start to dig into this, this is where that number comes from. So 150 pints per day at that uh, thing. It does 104 pints per day at the actual set point. This thing costs $4,300. And that's today's prices. If you look on the day that you're watching this, it might be very different. Who knows what's gonna happen with prices these days. So that's not 
an insignificant chunk of change for one machine that's going to run and draw energy, which is going to require maintenance and filter replacements, and then eventually is gonna die and it's gonna to need to be replaced. So if we instead were to take this number, this 84 CFM, and run it through an ERV, then we can come back to our uh, calculation here and say 99 pints per day dehumidification? No, cut it in half. We'll take it from, let's say 100, down to 50 pints per day, because an ERV, is really what it is at its heart is a buffer against spikes in outdoor hot and cold and in outdoor dry and wet. An HRV is a less good ERV. It only protects you against spikes of hot and cold. It has nothing to give you protection against spikes of wet and dry. So we're gonna cut this thing in half, and that's conservative, by the way. That's me saying, okay, let's say it does 50%. It really is probably gonna do more than that, but let's just be conservative for right now. If we did that, then we can go back to the same exact uh, page and we can see that the 70 pint per day unit does 55 pints per day. So now we can go shop for that and this thing is $1,700. That's a $2,500 difference in cost for adding an ERV. Now the question is, can we find an ERV that we can get for less than, and by the way, we're just talking about equipment here. You can't get this dehumidifier installed in your house for $1,700, unless you're gonna do it yourself, which I highly recommend. Do your own work, you're a homeowner, you should know how to, to do some of this stuff. But if you're gonna hire a professional, they're gonna take this number, they're gonna have to add cost for labor and then you know profit margin, blah, blah, blah to it, you're gonna pay $5,000 for this. So we're not talking about all of that, we're talking about just the equipment cost. Can an ERV cost less than $2,500? Yes, an ERV costs half that. So if we did in this example of a 2,200 square foot house with eight foot ceilings, with a blower or test of two, if we added an ERV, we cut our dehumidifier by half the size and we save $2,500 in the process that we can sink into that ERV, which is only gonna cost us about $1,200, you know, something in the range of $1,200, $1,500. So now we're net positive on our cash that we're spending on equipment. So there's the quick answer. And I wanted to give one final caveat because that thing that I brought up in the beginning where we talked about the dehumidifier in the basement um, being needed because it was 72% relative humidity in the basement. If you ever have an issue with basement located dehumidifiers not actually working that well, it might be that it's 65 degrees down there because if a basement is colder, these dehumidifiers don't run that well at colder temperatures. They kind of max out on their efficiency around 70 degrees. And by the way, at that temperature, they can't really pull out any more uh, water out of the air than I think about 40% relative humidity. They start to give humidity back to the air at about that level. So you're looking about that kind of break-even point. What you can do for colder temperatures is a desiccant dehumidifier. So this is an example of a desiccant dehumidifier. There's a wheel inside of it. You can't see any of this stuff from the photos, but this thing is quiet. So for small spaces, I recommend this. It has an ionizer, which turn off immediately, do not use ionizers to clean air. It's not a good idea, it does chemistry in your home. But the desiccant wheel uh, will work better at lower temperatures. So I have one of these, for example, and it's $271 today. So you could get a bunch of these. These are 15 pints per day, so not nearly as powerful as the stuff that we were looking at a minute ago, but useful to know what's out there. And by the way, if you go to Asia, you can get a whole bunch of different Kind of stuff. So if you happen to be watching from somewhere else than you at the United States, you have lots more options when it comes to all of these pieces of equipment than we have right now. So I hope that that's been interesting. Comment below if you have anything to add. If you want this calculation and that psychrometric wheel calculator that I'm showing you right now, you can again download that on our website, uh, buildingperformanceworkshop.com. Like and subscribe. Tune in next time.